Hey, this is Dr. Emily Scherning with AR. I'm here to talk with you a little bit about AMOC collapse and what that would mean in terms of climate projections. And I feel like it's worth talking a little bit about why we should be resilient. What's the purpose of a resilient mentality when we deal with a week like this, which the climate news has been horrifying this week. We got like five Sigma events going on in the Northern and the Southern oceans. And then this paper about the ocean currents potentially collapsing by 2025 gets really big, blows up. And it's like, oh my gosh, what are we even doing this for? I've had people ask me what AMOC collapse would mean in terms of uh, climate projections before. And my response previously has been, well, you better hold on to your pants if that happens. I decided I was gonna push through my own like stress about it and actually get some answers. Unsurprisingly, some other quality nerds, finer quality nerds than me have actually done some modeling on this. Williamson et al. have this cool paper that was published in 2017 that I think addresses many of the questions and concerns a person might have looking at AMOC collapse. So we're talking about having the Gulf Stream shut down due to, in this paper, they say freshwater hosing. If we want to put this into somewhat more accessible language, that's talking about having this circulatory current in the oceans shut down because the glacial melt is putting in so much fresh water so fast as is happening as we heat up this El Nino cycle that the salinity that causes the ocean currents to rise and fall in depth gets too messed up and the AMOC shuts off. The AMOC, this whole current system, is bimodally stable, so it can either be on or it can be off. Some people talk about it getting weak or whatever. It doesn't really get that weak. It either works or it doesn't work. One of those type of things. This paper models what would happen related to that and changes in ENSO, in El Nino. And it makes some interesting correlations between the two of them. If you want to read this thing, if, if you're comforted by extremely dense, tight statistics, this will be a good way to put yourself to bed at night. If that's not going to comfort you, stick to the abstract, which is very clearly written and basically says that if you get into a situation where the AMOC turns off, where AMOC collapses, you're going to be getting regular periodic El Nino events, likely causing regular El Nino winters worldwide, and that they are going to be shifted somewhat east in the patterns to what we've seen before. Let's talk a little bit about what that's going to mean. So, in the event of an AMOC collapse, it would be extremely, let's say, problematic worldwide. In the Northern Hemisphere, you're going to see declines in temperature. In Northern Europe, which otherwise it's 2050 and RCP 4.5 modeling has some real potential for hope, look to Germany and get a little bit north of Germany. In Scandinavia, there's potential for some increased agricultural yields. In Central Europe, like around um, Czechia, looks really pretty nice at 2050. If we had a Gulf Stream collapse, if we had AMOC collapse, the degree to which it would become colder, 10 to 20 degrees C colder, would wipe out a lot of that potential, unfortunately. In the Southern Hemisphere, we would expect increased warming. We would expect the sort of El Nino warming that they're seeing. We have already reported before on the channel that that is currently uh, projected to have pretty devastating effects for Australasia. So we would expect that to be multiplied. The question that we have here in North America is what would this pattern change do to North America? Let's look at this figure from climate.gov. So this shows the current wintertime El Nino pattern. So when we look at this, this is what we expect to see this winter. Extreme storms, amplified storm track across the south from the southwest to the southeast. A mild winter across the plains from the Pacific Northwest and perhaps unusually dry winter over sort of uh, central east here as we're approaching Appalachia. If we saw an AMOC collapse, this would be a similar winter pattern, but we would push it farther east. We would continue to see strong storms coming across the south that would be problematic. It's not necessarily a problem that we're getting rain. I mean, we could use some of that hitting Phoenix now, but. Uh, the extreme storms, these like horrible hail dropping flooding storms, they're a major infrastructure problem. And if you look across the Gulf where you're already going to have flooding from sea level rise, 
it's hard to be too optimistic about an enhanced storm track on a regular basis, right? This dry bubble, there might be enough pressure to push it over Appalachia and get this dry winter sort of over this densely populated area, which in the event of AMOC collapse, that densely populated Northeast corridor is also going to face higher than previously modeled sea level rise. We would see a larger proportion of that housing stock lost faster. Hopefully everyone on this channel has gotten it um, into their uh, head that sea level rise isn't like a tsunami, like a wall of water coming at New York that's gonna destroy it in a dramatic way. It's a gradual rise from the bottom where you lose housing stock because of flooding, because of housing damage. It could be a high chaos event, right? A lot of migration, but a low mortality event. I think that's what we're looking at in terms of the Northeast and the highly populated Atlantic corridors in the event of an AMOC collapse. This pattern here, this mild winter, the warm winter pattern that we normally see in a winter El Nino would be pushed east, would be pushed over the Great Lakes. So we would be looking at a mild, wet, consistent winter over about this large area. We would lose the um, even vague assurance of this warm winter over the Pacific Northwest. And you can see that as usual, we have a challenge where we're gonna kind of fall off the edge of the modeling there. We have always talked about this potential destination region as being the most unstable in the modeling, the most potentially chaotic in the modeling. With uh, ocean current collapse, that chaos effect would be amplified. If we look at this destination region in the Northeast, we're talking about more housing stock lost, more challenge for the densely populated region. In terms of the Midwest, the Gray Lakes in the Midwest, AMOC collapse probably leaves that as your most potentially resilient region, perhaps one of your most potentially resilient regions on Earth, if you sort of overlay 4.5 modeling and AMOC collapse. But it's grim, right? I mean, if we talk about this black swan event happening, if we talk about it happening within our lifetimes in AMOC collapse, we are talking about an event that would likely cause a collapse of the global economy of global civilization as we know it. It would be a level of hit it's very hard to see how our future would resemble anything like our past, how our lifestyles would be anything like they are now. And I feel like it's worth talking about what it means to me to be resilient in the face of the level of change that we are likely to see in our lifetime. And even if you just look at the RCP 4.5 modeling for 2050, we're talking about high level of change in lifetimes. We're talking about goods and people moving around the planet less, moving around the planet differently. To make the greenhouse gas emission cuts we need to make, we need to live different lifestyles. We need to consume less. There needs to be less transportation and less consumption. When I began living resiliently, focusing on a sustainable lifestyle, cutting my consumption, cutting the inputs into my personal economic system and cutting the outputs, reducing consumption, reducing production in the capitalist system. It was so that I could spend more time on my relationships, my relationships with my loved ones, with my family, with my friends, my relationship with the earth, my relationship with living things. The resilience that I have cultivated has given me the freedom not to worry so much, not to be caught in the grind, not to be freaked out about when the paycheck is coming in because there's a lot of cushion in my life, the way that I've designed it. I think that building a resilient lifestyle, a lifestyle where you have a lot of given the system to bounce back from stress is essential to being able to navigate this high change landscape with any mental health intact. It's very easy in our world right now to be caught in a grind where you have no time or energy to invest in yourself or in relationships or in cultivation, in regeneration, in creation. When I see these apocalyptic type modeling to hit in our lifetime, of course I have the reaction that we all do of fear, but I think that there's also a space for gratitude there where we can think about the fact 
that we are alive now and that we have the opportunity to live how we want now. If you're a person who is feeling very oppressed by the grinding systems, the maximizing production systems, the maximizing consumption systems that we are all caught in at this time, you know, these apocalyptic events, they can be a wake up call that this could be the time to take the chance. This could be the time to step away. This could be the time where you try to create a life that feels good in the time that we have now. And I think that most of us have unfortunately realized that there is no amount of consumption that will fill the hole so many of us feel. Only regeneration, only healthy creative nurturing activity is gonna help to fill that hole. And if these are the last good years, we should fill it now. You know, let's get ready now. Let's live the way we wanna live now. That's the only way to get through this change and build a world worth living in. It's always possible that things will get so nightmarish that really there is no hope. But I'm gonna be here doing the best that I can, doing the best work that I can, building the best community that I can, as long as I can, because that's what brings me joy. I feel like we have had this privilege to live at a very strange time in human existence. And we should know that everything that we do right now really matters. What you do right now, it could really make a difference for you in 2025, in 2030, in your quality of life in this rapidly changing time. So let's get ready. I feel like these black swan events don't have to derail you. What you should be building with resilience is not like some hardcore survivalism where you hide in a concrete shack. You should be building a life. You should be building a life that as resilient as any natural system where you can help to support landscape transformation, where you can help to support economic transitions. This you know, we can take it as a call to lie down or we can take it as a call to action. Resilience for me, take the action and try to get off the computer this weekend, okay? Try and get out there, do something beautiful. Take care. Big thanks as always to everyone who contributes, whether you give money, whether you give time, our community keeps this project going. And thank you for being there with me. We've got our community chat coming up on Sunday, August 20th. If you want to join me then, I want to talk about what we can do to increase resilience in the South, the Southeast and the Southwest, talking about living with this level of change instead of fighting against it. I hope to see you there. And if you have any questions, you can email me anytime. I get back to everyone and I'd be glad to hear from you. Bye.